Hey guys, we have recently unboxed a Z490 motherboard from ASUS and it is time to populate it with a new Intel 10th Gen CPU. Here we have an Intel i7-10700K and it's an 8-core processor with 16 threads. It operates at 3.8 GHz base frequency but will boost as high as 5.1 GHz. On paper, it is basically identical to the more recent 9900KS, which itself is an overclocked 9900K. It does have a 200MHz lower base clock, but 100MHz higher max clock speed, and it also supports a slightly higher speed memory. For testing, we'll be going with a comparison between an older 8700K, and we'll be doing all tests at stock and basic overclock which is just a multiplier adjustment of 200 megahertz. We want to see if there is enough of a reason to upgrade your few year old CPU or if you should invest your money in other parts of your build. To start off, let's jump in into Cinebench R15. Here we can see 10700K immediately breaking the 200 point barrier for single thread applications and an overclock pushing it further to 229, which is really impressive. At the same time, 8700K is not that far behind. In fact, overclocked, it matches 10700K at stock. Moving to the multi-thread, we can see staggered performance. It is about 14% improvement at every step. There is no match between 8700K and 10700K, as the extra two cores and four threads make a really big difference. To be fair, this test finished too fast, so the CPU didn't actually get a proper workout. So let's jump into R20 and rerun this again. Here we find a very similar situation when it comes down to single thread. It is about 2.8% improvement for the first two, then 8% improvement for the overclock 10700K. In the multi-thread application, we get about a 10% improvement by overclocking 8700K, then 16% improvement when moving to a 10700K stock, and another 11% when overclocking it. That is a 42% improvement over a stock 8700K. Certainly an unfair comparison, but at the same time we need to consider that these two CPUs are in the same price bracket, just newer. This is what we get from the healthy competition between Intel and AMD, and I can't wait to see what happens in the future. What was very interesting here, the 8700K was given it all and was not thermal throttling. When it comes down to the overclock 10700K, while doing the multi-thread test, it would cap out at 100 degrees and then throttle down at 4.7 gigahertz on all cores. So it is a very hot chip and there is still a lot of performance in there, providing you can cool it down. Next, we jump in into 3D Mark Time Spy. Here we find a moderate improvement on the GPU side of about 5% by overclocking 8700K and then 1.5 to 3.5 on the 10700K. When it comes down to the CPU, once again we get about 15% improvement at each step, with a total of 55%, which is still a considerable amount. Over to a 7-zip benchmark. Here we see a 17% improvement by overclocking the 8700K and a 12% improvement by switching over to a 10700K. Overclock on that yields another 20%. Yet again, our CPU is locked at 100 degrees, but we're getting 5 gigahertz speed or core, so there's only a little bit more you can push with better cooling. We are creators, and using Blackmagic Raw Benchmark, we can see a very interesting story. Overclocking the 8700K yields 9.4% improvement on the CPU and about 2.7% on the GPU. Moving up to a 10700K stock, we get another 8.5% on the CPU and lose almost 6% on the GPU score. But overclocking it gets us a whopping 22% improvement on the CPU and 19% on the GPU. This is very impressive as video editing is taxing on the whole system at all times. So having such a drastic improvement from more cores and a higher clock speed is very welcome. Now moving over to gaming. First we test Shadow of a Tomb Raider settings set to 4K high and motion blur turn off. Our GPU average goes up by about 2% when overclocking the 8700K and by a further 4.4% when moving over 10700K. Overclocking it, there's absolutely no difference at all. When it comes down to the CPU average, there is a 15% improvement from overclocking the 8700K. Then we lose 3% by jumping to a 10700K stock and we gain 25% improvement by overclocking it. In Total War Three Kingdoms, we dropped down the resolution to 1080p. 
and set it all to Ultra. We get a 1.5% improvement when overclocking the 8700K and then 3% by swapping to 10700K. Again, when we overclock it, there is absolutely no difference. Lastly, we move on to Formula 1 and here we basically see the same results. Overall, on all of these games, getting higher clock speeds does mean a slight improvement, but it tops out quite quickly because ultimately we're bottlenecked by the GPU. So what did Intel do to this chip? As compared to the 8700K, it seems it's a really big improvement. But then again, that was a two-year-old chip. When compared to the 9900K and the KS versions, the difference is not that significant, at least on paper. But you also have to consider, that used to be a top-tier consumer CPU. Now you can have it wrapped up in a slightly faster and considerably cheaper i7 package. It does get really hot though, so if you want to get all the performance out of there, you're going to have to get a really good cooler. We have actually benched this using Prime95 across all four different setups. And about 10 minutes later, when the temperature stabilized, we get the following results. 8700K at stock reaches 65 degrees and is maintaining a 3.8 gigahertz speed across all cores. When overclocked, it reaches 80 degrees and stays at 4.1 gigahertz at all cores. 10700K while stock reaches 94 degrees and maintains a 3.9 gigahertz speed at all cores. When overclocked, it jumps straight to 100 degrees, but keeps a 4.35 gigahertz speed, which is not too bad. The cooler we have here is not really made for heavy overclocking, but we have not really done any optimization. Granted, it is an open air bench, but overall, with a good amount of cooling, I can see this chip going further. We will test this in the future, so subscribe so you don't miss it. Let's talk about the price. 10700K has a recommended retail price of $374 to $387, but like always, expect it to be in the low to mid 400s, at least in the first few months. Also, it doesn't come with a cooler, so I'd recommend spending at least $35 to get a Cooler Master Hyper 212 EVO. If you're overclocking it, you're looking at around $100. Probably go with a Noctua NHD15 or even a custom Waterloo. Now we're looking at a total price starting just short of $500 with a low end and upwards of $600 with a reasonable cooler. While this is a considerable discount from the last year's 9900K at the same or better speed, it is still considerably more expensive than AMD's offering. Also, this is a new platform. It actually seems comparable boards for both Intel and AMD right now are roughly the same price. So you could get an AMD Ryzen 7 3800X for around $400 or spend an extra $100 and get yourself a 3900X, both of which come with a reasonable coolers. Plus, by getting an X570 board, you'll be able to upgrade for at least one future CPU without changing your motherboard. To make the matter worse, as of recording this video, AMD has strategically dropped their pricing for most of their lineup and the two CPUs that are hugging their 10700K on each side are now even more appealing. So ultimately, it depends what you're doing with it. If you're looking for the highest possible clock speeds and you focus mostly on gaming and high-end graphics, then 10700K is a great choice. On the other hand, Ryzen CPUs can be as good and also potentially cheaper options with 50% more cores, which makes it very difficult to flat out recommend either one of them. Do bear in mind, AMD is going to be releasing Ryzen 4000 desktop CPUs very soon, so it might actually be a good idea to hold off and see when all the cards are out. If you are interested to check out any of the parts we've discussed today, check out the links in the description below. I hope this was useful. Don't forget to smash that thumbs up and subscribe for more. We'll see you guys in the next one.